Um, so we have a good idea of that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nomi, and thanks very much to everybody for joining and giving up your time for this valuable input that we're, we're looking for. Um, I think we've had the pleasure to have met many of you already in the preliminary stages of our project when we were gathering information and developing the status quo report. Um, and I think our, our chance today to feedback uh, our early thinking on how all this becomes uh, a very, very exciting and, and important uh, initiative. Um, I'm going to turn off my video and share screen now. Um, and it should be this one. And so first up, can I just check that you see seeing things on your screen and you see in my cursor for pointing? If I could have someone confirm that. I can see that. Yes, we do. Okay, I can see your great. Mouse. Okay. Yes, Is there anybody you. who's not? Uh, shot now. Otherwise, I'm going to go into full presentation mode. And again, let's get on with this. As uh, Jack had said, you, uh, you're dealing here with a very complex overlap of many jurisdictions. And those jurisdictions are um, effectively uh, city of Johannesburg, which occupies that portion of our study area, which is shown in dotted outline there. Uh, there's Mahali City that occupies that portion of the study area and uh, City of Chwane that connects uh, we right at the the east the western edge of Chwane over there. There is of course also a provincial boundary in play over here between Northwest Province and Gauteng and as an adjoining local authority we are also dealing with Madi Beng uh, from Northwest Province as well in this. So that's the festival of uh, of local authorities in this and obviously there's a regional requirement to bring a lot of coordinated planning across this whole issue and how in the process then to put um, infrastructure in place sensibly across all of this uh, as the basis of our smart city i'll be just giving a quick overview today and what you see in the overall context of the Gauteng city region which is diagrammatically, uh, obviously, the CBD of Johannesburg over here, Tony to the north, you don't have it on there, uh, Mokhali City over here, and uh, the Cradle of Humankind at Lanseria Airport and Madi Beng beyond that. Our study area effectively covers that portion of this city region, and it's that part of the city region where there's a lot to be resolved around that enduring problem that we have of how to make sense of nonsense. The nonsense that was left as a legacy of apartheid planning uh, is an ongoing, probably for the foreseeable future in, in, my, in, in my terms, uh, of how to make sense of, of something that is basically left us with a lot of marginalized communities on an urban fringe. And how are we going to use something like Lanseria and a smart city initiative to regionalize those people and create a, a valuable and effective part of the urban system in this area. So if we look at that in context, this is the northwestern sector of the city region based with Johannesburg, CBD, Tswane, Mahali City. And as ever, these huge connectors, the Randstad between Johannesburg and Tswane have predicated on Midrand, the western corridor historically uh, uh, going out to uh, Krugersdorp and Randfontein beyond that. Uh, then we've got the N14 highway, a high capacity and one of the few bits of high quality transportation in the area. And then we've got uh, Madi Beng, uh, sorry, uh, Malibongwe uh, as a an activity spine that reaches out to Lanseria and transitions into Pelandaba Road that takes us past the dam to uh, Brits and, and uh, Northwest Province and Russenburg ultimately, obviously. And uh, it's at that point of that crossover with the N14 and Malibongwe that we look to make this urban intervention of the new smart city. Um, if I was describing this to my mate in a pub, I would start on the back of a cigarette box on a blank sheet. And I would say there we have Malibongwe Drive reaching from Johannesburg to the dam. There we have the N14 as a probably one of the few pieces of really big infrastructure in the area. 
and there we have Lancero, which is really one of the few pieces of real urban economy that we've got in the region as well. And what we've had over the years, of course, is an evolving corridor of growth along Malibongwe out towards Lanseria, but still, of course, lots of big vacant pieces in all of that. We do, however, have a lot of marginalized sprawl out there, as I mentioned, notably with Dipslert, um, and to a lesser extent, but nevertheless so, with uh, Cosmo City. We've got real impediment to growth, and that's good because this exercise is the antithesis of urban sprawl. We're looking at how to get smart and sustainable by encapsulating uh, compact urban development. And so the uh, Cradle of Humankind World Heritage Site, all our farming potential out there, these extraordinary mountains that we have out there, the recreational value, the aquifers, all the good stuff about the green things, which also, of course, sit to the north uh, east of us in the form of the Donosta Sprite Reserve, etc. All limits our capacity to sprawl, and we welcome that, because what we're really trying to do is to say, how are we going to use the energy of this corridor? How are we going to use the energy of this uh, radial corridor as well of the N14 to create a whole new infrastructural investment into the area that kind of forms a development trellis that we can grow the city on. But we grow it then around providing new economic drivers into the area. This is not a housing-led project. This is to bring economic prospect into the area that makes sense for us then to consolidate an urban development that now starts to make sense of this marginalized sprawl and pull it all together. And so there's the diagram and what that looks like when we get to this bigger level of looking at the the huge urban region uh, that we're dealing with. We sit in an area with very little capacity in terms of infrastructure other than really one very major highway. And that shows in the way the pattern of the uh, the, uh, the greater Gauteng area has grown. And so we sit, in a sense, almost in a bit of a development vacuum uh, over there. And what we're looking to do is to say that with Lanseria Airport being there, we'll upgrade Malibongwe is the way we see it, but we're going to upgrade it so that straight away we're talking about this ability to try and deliver high occupancy vehicles, be that formal public transport or uh, dedicated routes for, in the mean, in the medium term, it might be taxis, but ultimately, of course, we're talking about bus, rear via, um, possibly even a transition to light rail going forward. Uh, and knowing that we've always got the fallback of the PWV3, uh, should that hit valve bounce from a traffic point of view. There is, of course, a separate study going on at the moment by, by uh, Sanral, looking at, uh, are we better off upgrading uh, Malibongwe or looking at the the installation of part of PWV3 or all of PWV3. Um, there's our um, map of road infrastructure in terms of the Gauteng strategic road uh, network. Uh, of course, a hell of a lot of it's not built, so it, it, it flatters to deceive at the moment. What's also terribly important here, of course, is the uh, the red line down in the bottom right here with Santon is the piece of uh, a train that's already in place. And phase one of Gha train's expansion looks to become the link from uh, Santon via Randburg to Little Falls and then a spur going from that out to Cosmo City. What we, of course, want to achieve very quickly is an increased uh, connection out to Lanseria Airport so that Lanseria is effectively connected to Oliver Tambo uh, International Airport. And what we need out of that then is that as a city building exercise sooner rather than later on which we will grow our smart city uh, roughly in that sort of position. And that's the focus of, of all of that. If we look at our development potential, all these 50 shades of grey that you see here fundamentally about um, areas that are already developed, uh, that are able to be developed or with limited constraint around development. And if we pull all of that together, that's more or less the area that we can consolidate into within our study area. The study area is vast. It's about a 25 kilometer drive from the airport in any given direction. 
and uh, and we are treating this thing as a master plan that covers that whole study area, although relatively little of that will in fact be urban development uh, and much more of it will be around policy related to agriculture, heritage, um, recreation, and of course, uh, uh, ecology. So if we take in that area, we better be damn sure we can do that sustainably. That's our requirement. And there's a great tendency to think of sustainability as something in a green agenda, which obviously is important, or that this idea of a smart city is just a tech-heavy kind of thing with lots of um, uh, kind of cyberspace thrown into the mix. It's much more than that. There are very many underpinnings to urban sustainability, and we've got to be conscious of all of those. And just very quickly to run through them, Whatever we do is going to be the antithesis of sprawl. It's going to be compact in its extent, and the emphasis is going to be on walking distances. It's also going to be complex in its activity patterns because we need to be able to uh, live, work, play, and pray in this area to reduce the need to commute. We're going to be looking for spatial inclusion. It's not good enough to say that the private sector can just carry on delivering cities. Sandton has delivered all kinds of things, but it hasn't delivered a democratic inclusionary city in many respects. It's actually an exclusionary city. One would say the same really of Waterfall City in many respects too. Uh, And so we know we've got to accommodate uh, the broad socioeconomic profile of South Africa to be truly post-apartheid and uh, we have to allow for local economies to grow within that that are meaningful to all participants and that we work in this dual logic economy rather than just a big centralist economy. It's got to be public transport based otherwise it's not sustainable. Going to 30 million people in Gauteng over the next 30 to 40 years isn't going to get the job done in thinking we're going to do it with private mobility. We're going to have to reduce the need to commute and non-motorized transport will be the default. And if you can't get that, you're going to get onto public transport. We're going to, of course, have as an underlay to all of this, uh, the the important principles of ecology and biodiversity. Uh, and on that basis, we're able to now start thinking about the pattern of the city that makes it sensible and efficient from an energy point of view and all the things we can do within that. And we can achieve that and that will be a lot of what will come through from the SMEC portion of the team today on how you think holistically about infrastructure and how you achieve sustainability through that holistic thinking. Uh, And so smart cities, of course, do have smart infrastructure, but they've got to earn that infrastructure because we've got all these other basics right. And the way the world is moving, there's a whole way in which you do long haul rail, short haul road, and uh, the next generation logistics hubs allied to the airport as an air base, of course, is terribly important. <clears throat> Our service infrastructure will also, of course, going back to that issue of holistic uh, incrementalism, is a way of understanding uh, a, a very different way of putting infrastructure into regions in a way that you manage the risk of thresholds in all of that. Uh, And then remembering that urban agriculture isn't something that happens far away in a rural area. It's actually part of the urban economy. And this breadbasket thing is an extraordinary opportunity for us. And we we aim to maximize that. So there's where we think we put the the city center. It's effectively at the crossroads of Malibongwe Drive with the N14 and puts us in a position to latch onto Lanseria Airport. Uh, It comes out of a policy document that's been developed by province over many years, and we've picked up on this polynucleated urban structure that's tied together with corridors and activity spines, but we focus in, in, because of smart infrastructure and, and efficient input, we look to this region at the core of it all. Uh, to develop that. And if we look at that, uh, the yields are extraordinary. Very quickly, we can yield another 15,000 hectares into the urban system. And we can very easily, without too much trouble, show that we can achieve uh, a mixed use profile of uh, of integrated living, commercial warehousing, uh, business, industrial, freight, 
airport related stuff and of course residential to the tune where as Jack said we can get in the order of 850,000 housing units into all of this but it's not going to be housing led early housing will go in as part of the mixed use it'll be higher density and it'll be integrated um, the area we're looking at then as the overall framework it as I say takes up relatively little of the overall uh, study area, but it looks to uh, consolidate a uh, corridor down into Makhali City. It looks to consolidate a corridor along the N14 towards Chwane. It um, and it looks to use agri tech, that is processing uh, agri villages, high intensity agriculture. Uh, of course, not just at this one point, but that is an important point because that's the Johannesburg Northern Farms. And obviously, it's heavily related to the water as a byproduct of what is increasingly come to understood as a water resource center, both the existing Northern Artful Works and the proposed one at Lanseria. There'll be more about that now, obviously, because of the discussion around Lindley and the issue of whether there should be maybe even a super regional um, water resource center somewhere further north at the confluence. All of that will come out of the discussion. But for us, that's an important part of our agricultural program, as indeed is all the bigger green area that you see here, which is about heritage and tourism and agriculture and aquifers. And that in turn, of course, is part of the much bigger green belt that surrounds the whole urban system of, of the uh, 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 GRC. So if we look at the core of that, there's where we're looking to make our major impact in the short term in a consolidated way. And really what it's saying is we've got the airport, we're going to try and allow as far as possible for its expansion requirements with a second runway. Uh, we've got our urban core down here. We've got an underpinning of all our ecological systems. We've got an institutional piece in here to cover conferencing and um, uh, world trade centers and all sorts of things. Uh, and then we've got this uh, commercial and freight and logistics kind of zone that ties that all together. We've got more development that is possible to tag onto the northern side of the runway over here in this area. And all of that really becomes our zone of urban consolidation then in this diagram. That's effectively the, the, the roads that support all of this. And the town centre itself becomes that idea of a, a connection predominantly fixed in here with an open space system, non-motorized transport routes, uh, road networks and key activity zones here that link it then with public transport, with shuttle systems and the walkable city uh, and with car train coming through this area to, we hope, deliver the equivalent of a central station right here as a, a major uh, a transit orientated development. And when we look at all of that, there's uh, fundamentally a whole network of different public transport systems, being high occupancy vehicle lanes or BRTs or light rail, car train coming through to service uh, both this, the airport and our new city, light rail that can morph out of all of this earlier or later doesn't particularly matter and the local bus service and all the uh, inner city shuttle movement systems all of that sets up in terms of our uh, master plan as stuff that has to be understood as the network and that's what it is if you reduce it and you look at our urban core you look at our institutional core you look at an expanded urban system picking up around all of that investment and you look at further expansion to the north of the airport, all in such a way that if you take Stain City and everything it's got there in Cosmo City, um, it's then possible to form this uh, corridor down to Mahali City and the corridor to uh, Tiny in such a way that it's now sensible to start over time consolidating on what we've put in place as urban structure, all of course hemmed in and weighed down on by this um, this green urban yoke that I speak about. Uh, uh, and that effectively is the diagram to leave there for discussion then. I hope that for the first time I've stuck to a 15-minute program. Thank you. <laughs>
Thank you very much, Erki. Um, that was a really informative. Um, can I pass over to Dion, please? Thank you, Dion. Thank you, Nomi, and thank you, Jack and Erki, for setting the scene, and Erki for getting through a, a mountain of uh, of presentation work very, very quickly. Um, this afternoon, we are going to present the integrated infrastructure that we are proposing for the Greater Lanceria area. Um, it is still a work in progress, um, but in some aspects uh, quite well developed, others uh, maybe a little less so, but we're very keen to, to get the feedback from the assembled audience here. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for giving of your time this afternoon. So, uh, just by way of introduction, um, my team is going to be presenting uh, various aspects. So Brian Harvey is going to talk to the water aspects, water, wastewater and stormwater. Jerome uh, Schroeder is going to speak about electricity and Bernardina is going to talk about solid waste at the, at the back end. Uh, Bernardina, if you could share your presentation there. Uh, if you could hold your questions to the end, uh, there's a lot of uh, material we've got to get through. And um, uh, yeah, we won't do that if, if we um, stop for questions. So please hold questions. Um, but yeah, if you could go to that first slide of ours, please. I am sharing my screen. Are you not seeing anything yet? Yes, I'm I seeing am. that. Okay. Uh, but uh, just go to the second slide, please. Should be there. I didn't see it move on. I'm still seeing the first slide as well. Yes, yeah. uh, Bernadina, we're still seeing the first slide. If you could try again, please. Let me just unshare and reshare again. Sorry about that. Maybe just, just while Bernadina is, is busy um, getting to that first slide. So obviously there's, there's a whole bunch of services needed in order to, to make a, a city viable and sustainable. And in no small measure, the lack of these services, as Jack touched on, is one of the reasons why this area hasn't um, developed to the potential that it, it can and, and will do. So we have taken a very holistic approach in terms of trying to integrate the, the services. So we spent a lot of time um, preparing position papers on various sustainability aspects in terms of reducing demand, uh, reducing waste, and uh, also looking at how we could use renewable energies. There we go, uh, Bernard, you know, you're sharing successfully now. Uh, so this little map kind of uh, sets out all the components that make up, uh, the components that make uh, a livable city from a servicing point of view. So it's a whole bunch of things that need to be integrated. And in order to do that in a sustainable fashion, uh, is, actually quite a challenge and historically us as engineers have tended to plan these things in silos and, and not really looked at across the borders uh, in terms of um, integration of how we could get energy out of wastewater uh, treatment um, using biogas and, and the likes. So that, that sort of whole integrated approach is, is fundamental to how we're going to build a new um, sustainable sort of post-apartheid city. The little diagram in the bottom right-hand corner is, is vital. Um, land use drives everything in terms of infrastructure provision. It drives the demand for water, demand drives the uh, wastewater that's then created from that. It also drives the how stormwater is handled, transport, which was a completely separate discussion earlier today, and also obviously energy and in a country like ours where we've been going through rolling blackouts we all know that uh, energy can no longer be taken for granted and it's something that we need to to nurture and plan for and it doesn't necessarily have to come from one big utility it can come from um it can come from renewable energy and um a big problem is kill this thing yeah um it can come from renewable energy it can come from a biogas, from wastewater treatment, um, things like a, a wastewater treatment plant or water resource center, as we would like to uh, call it, um, is a, a energy hungry um, piece of equipment. And more than 50% of the 
operating cost of a wastewater treatment plant is energy. So if you could harness the biogas that you generate from that wastewater treatment plant um, for energy to actually drive the plant itself, it's a massive saving. And along those lines, we prepared um, position papers on all the, the service lines as to what could be done to minimize the demand in the first place, because that's always the first um, step in the process. And further, how we could then use, um, you know, get uh, energy from waste in, in various guises. So all these initiatives have been considered, but on the macro planning scale, we still need to plan for conventional technology to set our um, sort of upper limit of what we're looking for in terms of demand. And especially when it comes to things like wastewater treatment, which Brian is going to touch on just now, that is a crucial thing in terms of planning uh, within this geography. Uh, can you go to the next slide for us, uh, Bernardino? So on this slide, uh, Brian will touch on it, but the whole um, concept of looking at the water balance within a city precinct, historically we've always um, and Johannesburg and, and the, the whole bit part is runs very guilty of that, of being supported by potable water being transported in from, from outside of its catchment uh, to, to make it viable. Uh, one needs to, to try and minimize that volume of water coming in from outside and look at the sustainability of the city on its own. And how do we maximize that uh, the recycling of water within our, our um, precinct or our greater uh, study area to, to minimize the, the demand for water being brought in from outside. Those are the, the big sustainability and, 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 and smart issues. Yeah, uh, as Erki touched on earlier, um, there, there are lots of smart um, tech components and it's often um, thrown forward as that is what a smart city is about. Yes, smart grids in the electricity space, which Jerome is going to speak to in a, in a minute or two, is, is a reality and it is a, a very savvy way to manage your, your demand side and also to um, distribute your, your your power consumption. But the, the, the smart is not about the tech, it's about putting the right things in the right places and, and, and fundamentally following that little diagram in the left hand corner, which is firstly avoid doing it, secondly reduce doing it, then reuse and only at the last, um, at the bottom end of that triangle, you actually end up in a situation where you actually have to dispose of waste. Uh, and and um, if one follows that philosophy with everything that you do in all the services, you get to a very um, efficient and sustainable um, environment. So uh, we touched on the, the smart city concept and the re re reusable energy, and um, I won't take uh, uh, steal Jerome's thunder. Uh, this component on the right speaks to the efficiencies involved in, in, in the transport, and I'm sure that was touched on in this morning's session. So I would like to introduce Brian Harvey now to take us through uh, the water and wastewater section, and uh, especially with the emphasis on the wastewater, because it is such a burning issue in this geography, um, and uh, uh, key decisions have to flow from that. So I'll, I'll pick it up later when we handle questions. Thanks, Brian. Uh, thank you very much, Dion. Hello, everybody. Uh, yeah, so I'm just going to take you through three things. As Dion said, we're going to discuss the water, the wastewater, and the stormwater. This first slide that deals with potable water. Um, it, it just gives you a, a perspective on the existing infrastructure in the area. The bulk and reticulation level infrastructure are shown by, by yellow lines on the figure with our study over being outlined in grey. Uh, what you can see from the figures that, that certain portions of the site or of the study area do in fact have you know, infrastructure available, but it's very much towards the, the southeast eastern region where the development uh, has taken place, where there, there is existing development. So what we need to do is provide additional infrastructure or upgrade existing infrastructure uh, to, to cater for the study area. Go to the next slide for me, Bernalina. We've, as Dion sort of mentioned, we, we, we've, we've done our initial calculation based on sort of status quo in terms of technologies and how one arrives at demands. So if we sort of apply that, um, 
under that assumption, we we get to these 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 demand values uh, shown on this figure here. Uh, the big problem is that the, the the status quo within within that study is 98 megaliters per day. Um, we're looking to increase that by 344 percent if we if we do things the way we're currently doing them. Uh, and you know the the the, the supply is being catered for by the Gauteng uh, Water Security Plan, um, but that doesn't mean that we, we shouldn't look to save water. So so that's where we currently are. We're looking to to implement certain measures to to move away from these numbers and and, and get those uh, down as as far as possible. Go to the next slide. Uh, in terms of in terms of potable water and implementation of future infrastructure, the topography in the area it lends itself well to to gravity fed reservoirs. We have several sort of hard points in the area with with uh, we want to sort of site reservoirs. Uh, so we just put, this figure shows potential locations for reservoirs, showing that most of the study area could be could be serviced. Um, we what we now need to do is take this forward and establish service areas for each reservoir. As one does that based on minimum and maximum static head requirements, and then we, we can expand the demand calculations further and and size these reservoirs. Thanks, Renatina. Um, in terms of sewage and and sanitation, um, this figure shows the study area uh, and it shows some of the key rivers with a. With the wastewater treatment system, conventional systems, they they, they rely, rely very much on the natural topography because the the what you seek to do is you seek to drain via gravity, and the natural because stormwater would normally do that or runoff or in you know, a let's say greenfield site would normally form these natural systems. Those natural systems are very really applicable to to where you place your plants. You'd often put a put a conventional plant downstream of a catchment and take everything to that point, treat it there, and then release it back into the natural system. From this figure, you can see that four, uh, ex uh, four wastewater treatment works uh, interact with the study area. There are two that are existing in Driefontein and Northern, and there are two that are proposed, uh, which are Lanceria and Lindley. Uh, on, on this figure, the how the system works is you have the blow bank sprayed, the crocodile, clay, nyukske, nyukske rivers, sort of draining from south, the general water from south to north, and they all drain, and then they, they link up to the crocodile through a system of confluences, and they eventually drain into the Hattabiaspur Dam, uh, just north of the of the figures. Um, what's clear from these figures is in areas downstream, a, a big issue is areas downstream of the Defontaine and northern obviously don't have provision for for wastewater services, or wastewater treatment services, and that's a, that's a problem that is limiting development in the in the area. Um, and that's obviously what what Lonseria, the planned Lonseria and Lindley plants uh, seek to seek to address. So those are crucial in unlocking development. These are the demand calculations. So as as for the water, we've 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 made a similar assumption of of existing technologies to to come to come to our uh, our initial demand values. Uh, to do that, we we have taken in in terms of spatial. Spatial uh, land allocation. We've we've catered for existing developments and planned and unplanned developments. And planned and unplanned sort of relates to what we're planning as part of the Greater Lanceria Master Plan. Obviously, we anything outside of that could still develop. So we we have a lot for that. So so it's all it's all inclusive. Um, and as I mentioned, one can see from these values here that the the demand is large. Um, if you under the assumption of a conventional system, it's too large. You you want to get the down significantly. So that's that ties back to to what Dion spoke about earlier about about applying sustainable measures to get these these values down. As it stands at the moment, because of these increased demands or the increased densities uh, that we're sort of working towards, as mentioned by Erki, uh, the, the 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 intended plant sizes for Trifontaine, Lanceria, and Lindley are actually too small. Uh, with Trifontaine, you'd have to increase by 16 megalitres based on the planned final size. Lanceria is sort of touch and go, so the, the 150 plan could, could probably work. You could make a plan for that 4 megalitres, uh, but Lindley is, is way undersized. Um, so once again, under the assumption of a conventional system, uh, the, the demand is, is, is extremely high. It's pretty, you know. Uh, yeah, so, so this slide just zooms in on Lanceria and Lindley. Um, the, as I mentioned, they, they're crucial to unlocking development in the area. What one can then do is introduce package treatment plants. 
I believe there are developments which aren't secure on the figure, but towards the center of the figure, there are there are two developments that, that I do believe have their own package treatment parts. Uh, so, so that is something that that we can do as an interim measure to to uh, you know to unlock development within the area. But obviously, it's better to have centralized uh, wastewater treatment works. We've also this 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 slide also shows or this figure rather shows the proximity concerns uh, in terms of Lindley and. Uh, Lindley and on Syria, there's been a lot of discussions whether these should in fact be merged. Um, you know, is it is it efficient to run two two relatively large plants so close to one another? Or would one rather just uh, set up a combined plant? <clears throat> excuse me, northern uh, north of the of the two waste retreatment plants at the confluence of the Yuxka and Crocodile rivers. We have had a look at that. Um, the initial issue is, is spatial issues. There's there's minimal space at the conference for the for the size of plant that's needed. It's not helped by the topography. One can see from the contours that it's it's uh, it's very steep. Uh, it, it hurts the topography. You can see where Lanceria, where the place mark for Lanceria is, it's 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 much flatter, and that's the type of topography one would sort of look for for a for a plant like that. Uh, another issue is, as Erky alluded to, uh, we have a we have a constraint to development uh, uh, in terms of dolomites, uh, just just sort of north and and west of the study area. Uh, you don't want to put a. It would be very difficult to put a, a large wastewater treatment plant, plant on that dolomites, both in terms of increasing capital costs and in terms of operational costs, in terms of risk monitoring that type of thing. So you, you wouldn't want to then go further downstream with that confluence. So, so there are some uh, constraints in place with with combining the plants. Um, it's also the, the the logic behind combining the plants is, is cost saving. Uh, but our, uh, we 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 working on researching it. But our initial our initial sort of indications is that because you sort of have diminishing returns once you start increasing the size of the plants, you you you, you stop seeing the full benefit of of have, of the plant getting bigger and bigger at around the hundred megaliter mark. Uh, the values reported earlier were, were sort of way above that. So on that, you could potentially justify having having two separate plants. Another concern regarding a regional plant is um, there's more to go wrong. If you have a, a, a big plant, there's two things that, that to consider. The one is the large, the, 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 the large treatment volumes and the concentrated release points. So you'd have, instead of having two separate plants, which might be easier to manage, you'd have one big plant, uh, if something goes wrong with that plant, you and your effluent quality drops. You're going to have a concentrated point of, of release of pollutants, which is not ideal at very very high volumes. Uh, and there's also a big phasing concern regarding Lindley and Lanceria. Uh, Lindley sort of functions; its, it's existing demand is, 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 is almost nothing about two megaliters. Um, it functions more to unlock development in the area. On Syria, however, however, does have a, a large uh, existing demand component of about 40 megaliters. Now, that, that 40 megaliters falls downstream of the northern waste for treatment works, and it's sort of being pumped back up to northern, which is which is not ideal. It's, it's large volumes to be pumping. Uh, it's, it's not good for the environment. It is not good for, for the, the balance sheets in terms of costing. So, on Syria, does have a it does have an urgency uh, element to it. If you if you look to to implement a regional plant, um, there there are many issues. There might be bureaucratic issues with you know servicing two municipalities and falling. I think it falls into city of Chuane or not exactly. I just have to confirm that. But in summary, you you're going to delay the provision of of waste for treatment works in that area, particularly on the Lanceria side where it is needed. And the Lanceria one itself also, you know, assists in, in unlocking development. So our, our, our initial opinion is to is to provision Lanceria for those reasons. Uh, the, a lot of the plans are in place. Uh, it, most of the EAs have been done. I believe they're just waiting for the water use license, and then so that the path forward is more established. Uh, we believe that 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 should be pursued uh, and get in play uh, applied as soon as possible, so that you know we can start unlocking development and then Lindley can come online in future. Areas that drain to Lindy, we can have a few package treatment plants, perhaps, um, and even even for the time taken to implement last year, we could also have some package treatment plants, as uh, alluded to earlier. Well, I think we'll move over to the stormwater. So this is the I did mention brief, uh, uh, briefly earlier the the drainage characteristics, but it's within the A2 catchment, forms part of the Crocodile Western Marico catchments. Uh, 
And as I said, that whole area drains from south to north into the Atabir Split Dam. Um, yeah, uh, so yeah, and we also understand that there are water quality issues with, within the within the study area, which which would need to be managed. Um, in terms of in terms of drainage methodologies, uh, the infrastructure we place to drain into the natural uh, the natural waterways as far as possible. We've initially identified five centralized attenuation ponds uh, to to assist with attenuation uh, on site attenuation to uh, reduce the the, the 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 peak flows downstream of those and to protect the environment. We we look into encourage uh, on site. Uh, uh, Sustainable drainage systems, uh, and the other provision for that is is made in, in in the green spaces on the land use plan. Well, and then I'll just hand over to my my colleague Jerome Schroeder. Will take us through the the electricity or the energy components of the the, uh, the infrastructure. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, hope you still can all see the uh, slides. Um, so. In terms of the area, we, the study area, we focused on the HV infrastructure um, purely based on the level of demand expected. Uh, currently present infrastructure um, on site, uh, that's depicted, that's uh, on the HV side, it is mostly ESCOM infrastructure. Um, <clears throat> green lines are the uh, high voltage lines, 400 kV. And above, the blue lines on the screen would be the local distributors, um, still high voltage, but uh, at 88 kV. There's a list of the uh, substations uh, present and on the, the image there, um, split by the um, split on the basis of uh, the metropolitan municipality uh, boundaries. Um, and then as well, there the are two uh, large uh, transmission substations uh, in the image um, with Lula Misa coming into play within the boundaries of the of the study area. There is a another one that is already on the uh, transmission development plan. I will, uh, when we get to the next slide, I'll speak about that. The key um, for the for the uh, study area, the key element will end up being the 400 kV lines that pass through the northern sector of the, of the study area and the future um, CCO uh, MTS uh, station, which is roughly the position that TDP doesn't uh, reveal the, the position, but it is close to the central core of, of our study area. Um, recent additions that uh, will, for the short to medium term, that will benefit uh, the development uh, of this area is the Ituba 88 um, KV substation, and then in the nearer term, there are also 88 uh, KV substations planned, um, as highlighted there. But that is close to the southern edge of the of the study area, um, whereas we focused on the on the center, the core for the, the shorter term. Bernardina, the next slide, please. The land use um, classification and, and split, that is what drives the demand. The, the land use determines the load classification. That goes with uh, a certain set of uh, demand parameters that we use for, for esti load estimation, demand estimation. So. That comes to a pretty impressive figure of just on 980 MVA for the study area. Uh, what the compact nature of the of the study area um, actually uh, does not speak generally to the to this level of demand, but it's purely the amount of floor area fitted into the density that, that is available in the study area that, that's planned for the study study area. Um, that generates that high level of uh, um, estimated demand. This table is evolving as the land use is, is being updated. The land use tables are being updated uh, 
consistently, I don't want to say continuously, but regularly. The, as I said before, the introduction of that uh, CCO MTS on the transmission development plan published by ESCOM, that will be a key element for the longer, longer term grid connectivity of the study area. And that will um, tie into the 400 kV lines to the north of the study area. The an item that we cannot um, uh, overlook at this point is that the demand growth within the study area will be linked to new uh, establishments as well as potential densification in the existing areas. And that is mostly to the southeast of the N14. The Cosmos City is the um, closer towards uh, um, along the Malibongwe Spine as well as to the south towards the um, <clears throat> towards the Mahali city um, area, Little Falls as well. That cannot be overlooked and that we also have to address as we um, continue the, the study. And Nadina, the next one. So in terms of, of approaching the electricity supply question as a, from a network point of view, a, a normal grid connectivity point of view, we actually now challenged with um, transitioning that approach to, to more non-conventional -convention, items to make sure that the implementation planning um, will address uh, more closely the future state. As shown in one of the earlier si slides, the electricity supply and low energy design are just two aspects of a, of a wider infrastructure um, approach that, that we need to address. So in terms of the supply landscape, currently it's grid dominated. Um, that's the immediate response will be for establishing high voltage infrastructure. We've, however, we've got three licensed um, metropolitan authorities. We've got ESCOM that actually is is in current prime position to service the, um, the development, the study area. We have to maintain the um, the basic regulations and, and legislative flame, framework in in uh, describing the supply landscape. Then we've got on the on the potential measures to to address the energy need of the of the study area. Uh, general uh, mention of the demand side measurement measures that can be put in place, uh, keeping the demand as low as possible, avoiding the demand as uh, Dion just pointed out in in the approach to to uh, addressing a scarce resource. First point is to avoid it. So looking at demand reduction via water eating, green building principles. Um, demand side management controls, shifting the demand outside our peak areas to avoid the, the pressures on the grid. The next um, two elements speak to gener um, finding alternative en energy sources um, other than the grid. We're looking at on-site generation, whether that's solar rooftop, micro wind systems. This can be implemented by households, institutions, corporate. It is the progression of uh, the uh, small-scale embedded generation uh, that is underway already, and that expansion into something that can be harnessed potentially as a finance stream for an SPV can also be explored. Of course, an established version of uh, on-site generation, we're looking at the wastewater treatment works um, prim primarily, as well as exploring ideas on alternative um, technologies that are coming to market um, currently and in in the near future, expansion of battery storage um, complexity and scalability is is a key theme that's that's underway. We're looking at fuel cells and the hydrogen um, industry. So it is an exercise in assessing that self-generation um, theme for future-proofing uh, the the city to make sure that the reliance on 
on grid power reduces. Yeah, and then I'll hand over to Bernadina for the solid waste section. Thank you very much, Jerome. Good afternoon, everybody. Okay, so according to 2016 statistics, more than 80% of municipal solid waste removal is done by local authority. This is done at least once a week, and it's for all three municipalities that we're looking at. The map that you see on the screen shows the landfills in the vicinity of our study area. The active ones are marked in red, although the Marie Louise and the Lake Hearts Flay landfills are actually approaching their full capacity. So for our study, we are actually focusing on the Khod Kopis and Robertson Deep facilities in both COJ and Mokhali City. This next map shows that the Randburg depot currently covers just over 70% or so of the already developed areas within our study boundary. So the waste generation stats from this depot have been used to inform our future demand calculations. Now, before any recycling or waste reduction initiatives are implemented, the projected demand for the study area comes to 1,657 tons per day. Waste reduction and reuse initiatives are obviously really critical um, for us to shift urban sustainability beyond the existing paradigms of, of infrastructure planning and, and the way that we're used to doing this. Implementing such initiatives could certainly reduce the waste generated. Um, it's estimated that this could reduce it by approximately 40%. This map on the screen shows some of our initial proposals for transfer stations with their associated coverage areas. These have been placed based on a few parameters, including accessibility from main roads, the airport's buffer zone, um, and they've also been strategically placed on municipally owned land, etc. From these transfer stations, waste will then be taken to the existing landfills that, that were previously mentioned. Okay, I believe that this concludes our infrastructure presentation and I will hand back to Julian and Nomi.